It's the Mike Missanelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Mike Missanelli Podcast, podcast episode number 95, doing it on July 6th. 2023 brought to us by the great people at Bet Rivers. I keep telling you to download that Bet Rivers app where you can make some money right now in the Phillies. Had you bet the Phillies to win every game uh, and over the last couple of weeks, you're in pretty good shape. So get that, that Bet Rivers app. Well, today is a very special podcast episode. Um, not because we're celebrating 4th of July, but this guest is like having the 4th of July explode right on your screen. It is a major get for the Mike Mustelli <laughs> podcast. The legendary morning TV man from Fox 29 joins us, Mr. Mike Jarek. Hello, Mike. Mike, so honored to be here. Uh, but there were 94 people you chose over me. Did you say this was the 95th episode? It's the 95th you... episode. We, don't, we didn't have 95 guests, however. We, we only do special oh. guests. Darren, my producer, will tell you that this is a very <laughs> discerning podcast mm-hmm. as far as guests go so we only go the, to the big names here. only the big ones and, the biggest uh, okay. of the big mike <laughs> biggest of the big. exactly okay and like this is right there with angelo cataldi as one of my guests which we did a little early because you both had these legendary morning show careers so let, let's start with that okay and, all right uh, because your journey is a really interesting journey and i love when i have guests on that are in this field to to track their journey but first of all, let's let's talk about the remarkable success you have had as a morning TV man in an era where it's really tough to be successful with a local morning TV show. So the general question is, what's the secret? I believe the secret to the su- success of Good Day Philadelphia uh, is that we are unlike any other morning show, not only in Philly, but in the rest of the country, because... I've traveled quite a bit, and we have viewers that stream our show all over the country, and we are different. I tell our producers almost every week, this is the most difficult TV morning show to do in the United States. It takes an incredible amount of work, but the key is, and I, I'm, this isn't disparaging other TV stations, but think about how other TV stations in the Philly market would handle this story and flip it upside down. How would Channel 6 do this uh, segment on, even if it's a cooking segment? Okay, that's how they would do it. Now we are going to do it the opposite way or flip it up a little bit, turn it upside down. And I think that uniqueness is what the viewers like. And knock on wood, the show is consistently number one and it has been for years. So I think that's what it is. And we don't do, we don't talk like TV people. We just talk like you and I are talking. And I think that really pays off. So is that how you flip it? Just just talk normally? Like, yeah. Give me the disparity between be, playing it straight as a TV man and the way you guys do it. How do you flip it? Well, like I don't introduce myself every morning. This is Fox 29's Mike Jarek. Now let's go to Fox 29's Sue Serio for the weather. We'll just come on and start talking. You know, just like we're talking now. I think people relate to that and like it, and it's refreshing. We're not that fake crap um, that most morning television personalities feel like they have to be. They have, they have to be somebody else, like they have the anchorman persona. I'm just I'm just me and everybody on our staff. We hire the the, the talent they call it, which I hate that term. Um, you now when we go on, you just be yourself. You are are you going to reveal stuff about your life? Are you going to be honest? Because if you're not, then you're not going to work with us because that's what we want. Uh, that's an interesting perspective because it's kind of the way I approach radio, but radio and TV are two different things. So uh, it, it's a lot more difficult for you for you to do that. So where do you draw a balance? Well, I have been extremely fortunate for the, the first person that hired me in the Philadelphia market was a, a guy named Roger LeMay and the news director was Jim Masoni. For some reason, when I came on and acted like I did from the very beginning at first they balked and said oh what is this i don't think this is going to survive 
But the but the ratings went up so high that they had to go with it, and then it just became our thing. They let me go to the line and step over it just a little bit and then come back. At the, and I just feel fortunate they let me just run with it and be myself. But I do go out of my way to be not shocking, but unusual. Um, I'm probably more unusual on TV than I am in my real life. In fact, I know I am. I want to say something that will make people laugh or make them go, oh, did that just happen on morning television? And it's paid off. When they brought me back, there was a news director who I think thought, oh, no, this guy's, this guy's coming back from New York and we're going to let him be the way he was. Um, but the powers that be in New York liked what I did and they had to accept it and it worked. And another thing that happened, the city of Philadelphia just accepted it and took me in like one of their own because I'm not from here, but I feel like a Philadelphian now. And uh, I think the key was the audience accepted it. The audience wanted it. And no matter how staid news directors or management is, they had to go with what the people wanted. Did that make any sense? It makes complete sense. Now, this is why that was a brilliant assessment, because when people watch a show or listen to a show, and I always said this growing up, when I when I got into radio, totally unexpectedly, but I used to listen to radio shows. I go, you know, there's a really division between the, the people that are delivering it on the radio side and the audience. They always had a division in. There. Yes. Like, uh, like they were doing it for themselves instead of including the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that that was a brilliant assessment that you made that. And that's the way I always try to do radio. I'm not doing it for me. I'm, I'm in this little booth. Yeah. But it's, it's all about relating to the, yes. you know, your, your audience is the customer. Basically, if you don't include them in what you're trying to do, then you, what do you have? Yeah. Well, that's a good analysis by you too, because it always seemed in the past that the anchor person or anchor people seem like they thought they were a little bit above, a little more educated, a little more savvy, a little more tuned in than the audience that that's itself or it, themselves. Uh, and that's not the case. You want to be one of the audience members. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so that explains a lot about the success of the show. If I can add one thing, Mike, if you don't mind. Sure. One thing we talk about in radio. The most this is producer Darren, by the way, for the people that don't Hi, know. Darren. Producer Darren, <laughs> the voice in the wilderness. Right. So we talk about the most successful radio shows. There's still a connection. If you're doing an hour of sports talk radio and six minutes of that hour is you talking about your life, so something that people can relate to. That's the six minutes that they're least likely to turn the dial because that's right. ultimately it's, it's connection and relatability. And that's what you guys do as, as compared to any other morning show in the market. So I think. It's and, and to, and to, uh, to remember that particular conversation and want to come back for more. Right. Yes. Instead of like the X and O of a sports exactly. play. Like if I'm talking about carrots in a grocery store and they relate to that, well, I go, well I'm going to come back and hear another story later. And they, they come back to the show. That's exactly so, what so people say. say when I'm walking down the street, they'll stop me and say they, they never bring up like a particular segment. They always want to talk about what was said among the group of us, what Alex said to me, or I said to Alex or uh, Sue couldn't stop laughing. It's all the interstitial stuff. That, that, that they talk about. Yes. All right, so let's talk about your journey. Um, uh, you're a guy from Wichita, Kansas. Yes. You, you go to KU. Yes. Uh, Kansas University. Jayhawks. And, uh, and you, 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 like, where does this, this, uh, this TV um, ambition come from? Where, where did it start for you? And then just take us on the journey, because your first job is in kind of close in Topeka. Yes. Uh this started in my head when I was probably eight or nine years old. I would be in bed and my mom would turn on the radio for the seven o'clock news. And I could, even though I was still in bed, I could hear it coming from the kitchen radio. And there was a guy named Jim Setters on KWBB radio. And I wanted to be that guy. I was a real shy dude. I just loved the fact 
I mean, I was incredibly shy as, as a child, but this guy seemed to have it all together. He knew what was going on and he was telling the world about what was going on. And I wanted to be him. But I was raised in a very conservative family, not politically or anything like that, but Roman Catholic. And and you, you never boasted. So when I had this dream in my head of being on radio or television, I kept it to myself uh, until I got into college. I even told my parents I was uh, in an education degree. I was going to become a teacher because I was embarrassed to say I wanted to kind of show off, be in a show off world of television, especially. So I finally, I had to admit it. And they said, well, we don't care. So I got my degree. I worked for a radio station, KLWN in Lawrence, Kansas, because the woman I was dating, her father did the football play-by-play for Lawrence High School, and he got me a job as a salesperson at the radio station. I hated every second of it. I didn't want to ask people for money. So because I had such low self-esteem and so shy, I just said, well, this is what I'm going to have to do, I guess, the rest of my life. It got so bad. I hated the job so much. I used to drive from Lawrence about 30 minutes over to Topeka, Kansas, drive into the parking lot of WIBW uh, TV and force myself, get out of the car, go in there and apply for a job. I must have done that five times over four months until finally I sucked it up, got out of the car, walked into the TV station. And there was a a woman by the name of Marlene behind the desk. And I said, I'd like to apply for a job. She says, okay. said, I filled out an application. Program director comes out and he goes, oh, we just had a guy quit yesterday. I still remember the guy's name, Rick Cupper. What job did he have? He worked in audio production, but he did noon weather. So he said, hey, come into the uh, studio. We'll do a quick audition. I'm flipping out. Oh, my God. He wants me to do an audition on television. I don't know what to say. So I, he said, do the weather. Do, give me three minutes of weather. So I just mimicked the guy that I used to watch doing the weather. And his name was Jerry Wallace. Uh, so I did my two and a half, three minutes. The guy comes out and goes, that was really good. When can you start? And my TV career was launched. Two weeks later, I was out of that radio station and we're doing the weather in Topeka, Kansas. And, it ha- wow. and knock on wood. It's never ended. You Wally t- Pipped so this, this was obviously <laughs> yeah, post-college. Wally Pip. <laughs> yeah, post, this was post-college. This is right out of college, yes. Right out, right out of college. Uh, okay, so now you start as a news, a serious news guy, I believe, and then it, it you're, I mean, you're ho- then you start hosting all these shows, and then, and then you get up to New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that, that was a big jump. I went from Topeka to Kansas City for a little while, and then this big jump to the number one market when I'm in my 20s. You know, I, I loved every second of that move. Uh, you just because really because that would be intimidating for a lot of people from Kansas, yeah. right? You're, all of a sudden, you're not in yeah. Kansas anymore. You're, you're thrown into the cauldron of New York City. So, what well, was that adjustment like? Because now you're it's serious game now. Oh, it it got serious real quick. I had never been to New York. And it was one of those things. They hired me over the phone because they liked my work. And so my impression of New York growing up as a kid in Kansas was that it was basically always dark, like the sun never shined and everybody was gruff and uh, and mean and I was going to get mugged and all that kind of stuff. So uh, they fly me into New York, land at LaGuardia, pick me up in a limo, take me down to New York Harbor put me on a yacht to introduce me on the first show. And I go, oh my God, was I totally wrong and fell in love with it from that moment on. And the, sh- the show I did was called PM Magazine at uh, Fox 5. And we'd go to every borough once a week, so I learned the city real well. So it went from total intimidation, not so intimidated I didn't take the job. I wanted to be in the number one market, you know, big time guy. Uh, but my view of New York changed instantly and to this day i love it okay so you um you actually uh then you know you went you did a show usa today we go you went to san francisco after new york right yeah you want to you want me to tell you a story about why i left the number one market with the yes. number one show yeah, in the evening you went to san all right strap in i'm from a family of six 
my older brother's 10 years older than I have. I was raised with four sisters, a very quiet dad. I always wanted his approval. And I thought, you know, he loved my brother more than me, all that kind of silly stuff. Um, and when I moved to New York, he still couldn't see me on TV because he's living in Wichita, Kansas. So I take this number one job in the number one market and I throw it away to take a job for the USA Network in Los Angeles so my father can watch me on TV. Isn't that something? That is something. Uh, so <laughs> how so pathetic. You, 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 that's, it's after that. You come to Philly, right? So the well, like, you, you you did you feel you canceled because you're in love with New York? Obviously, your you know, your ego is obviously in play here. You're in number one market. You leave that, and it's like, uh, did I make a really big mistake? Well, here? there were jumps here because I went from L.A. to San Francisco, back to work for NBC in the '90s in New York, and then something came up in my personal life. My daughter was struck, Jill, you, um, was struggling a little bit in high school. So I quit, moved to, back to Lawrence, Kansas, where she was living, bought a house and put her through junior and senior year of high school. Now that was a weird move because now I'm out of the business. Yeah. And, and I'm in my 40s. Let's say what, that's Never going to get back in. It sounds like a noble move, though, for, for your personal life. So does Philly happen after that? Yes. Yeah, so I think now I'm out of television forever. I even went and applied for a job at the NBC affiliate in Topeka again. Now, again, I'm in my 40s and they offered me the evening anchor job. I think it was twenty four thousand dollars. I go, well, holy Lord, I can't do that. <laughs> then out of the blue, a former producer that I worked with in Los Angeles is now working for Fox. She calls me one afternoon and says, they just fired the morning guy at Fox 29 in Philadelphia. Would you fly out there tomorrow and audition for the job? <laughs> of course. So I fly out here. It was August 16th, 1999. I go on the set. We, we did a fantastic audition. My, the woman I was working with, Danya Archer, just got me through it. They offered me the job right after the audition. And I was working in Philadelphia two weeks later. So I took the job in Philly doing a morning show because I wanted to get back into television and it saved my career. Well, I remember Donya Archer. I had a crush on Donya Archer. Oh, so, I still uh, do. All due respect, I wasn't looking at you when I was looking at that morning show back well, in the day. Well, go to hell. But, but, but you, you're, <laughs> I'm you're a better good, kisser. You're good at it. And, and see, this this gets your career back on a, and then New York yes. comes calling again. And then you do yes. this monster show called Mike and Juliet. Yes. So, so and and that went. I mean, that was boffo. That was good. It was a. The dream is always to get a syndicated show because that's where the money is, um, and we we're cruising right along. And then the stock market crash of two thousand eight happened. Lost sponsorship. Show was canceled. The day the show was canceled, I was so upset because I loved working in New York. We we're right there in Midtown. The day the show was canceled. My big boss comes into my office and says, none of this is your fault. They need you. I'm going to send you back down to Philly to do Good Day Philadelphia again. And I go, well, I really, I mean, I love the people at Fox and I love Philadelphia, but I just want to stay here and have my life. I had a whole life set up in New York with all my friends. I was dating a woman there. And he goes, listen. You go down there for two years and I'll bring you back. They just need somebody right now. And the guy had done so much for my career over the years. Oh my God, that I couldn't say no. I really owed him. So I did it and I didn't go back two years later. <laughs> that was 14 years ago. Yes. And uh, yeah, I remember uh, that your replacement was was a guy named Dave Price, if I remember. I replaced him. Oh, so you replaced Dave Price. Okay, that was the guy they, they let go. go. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't like. I didn't enjoy him very much. So I was glad. I was glad when you, when you came back. So so now you come back, and and uh, obviously you're. Uh, did you work right away with Chanel? Let me go over the partners you work with. First of all, you're uh, okay. Danya Archer. And then I know you had such an incredible bond with Chanel uh, Jones over those years. 
there was another woman, a Carrie Lee Halkett, but I only worked with Carrie her Lee. Ah, about- uh, yes, I remember yeah. Carrie Lee Halkett. That was about three or four months. And then I went up and worked with Juliet Huddy for 10, 11 years. And then I, when I came back, I come into the studio. I'd never met Chanel. And she and I realized in the first minute, we're both from Wichita, Kansas. Wow. So the bond was connected instantly. And then, I mean, it was a tremendous coupling, a, a great on-air duo. Yes. And, and it's true. When you work with a partner for a lot of years and they dance, you feel this like, oh, my God, this is never going to be the same. So Chanel goes up to and gets the, the big Today Show job. Yeah. And, uh, and they hire uh, a young, uh, very inexperienced lady named Alex Holly. Uh, what was your impression on how you were going to have to ma- be able to make that work after Chanel being so close? To Bonnie? Yeah, I was uh, I wouldn't say devastated too strong, but very disappointed that that marriage came to an end. And it is a marriage. Um, so we we must have looked at six, seven hundred tapes that came in people wanting that job uh, at Good Day Philadelphia. And we knocked it down to five, brought all five in. But the moment I met Alex, uh, that was, it was instantaneous. I still remember the office she was sitting in. I walk in, she's off to my left. I look at her and I go, in my head, well, this is it. She is the replacement. Um, and there was another person we hired too, Lauren Johnson, who was, uh, we decided we, we really couldn't decide between the two of them. So we hired both of them and they're, and they're both fantastic people. Um, I don't know. There was just something about her, something natural, just adorable physically, but it was her quick wit and her intelligence. I took her down to Budokan for lunch. And by the end of the lunch, they got, I, there's no, it's, it, she's it. So I go back and say that. Now, I had the same reaction with Lauren Johnson. I went back and said, I don't know what you're going to do. So, again, we hired them both. It was a very good move on our part. And it, it's, it's managed to, to work. I mean, there were some rocky spots with her early on. Uh, how, how do you um, – yeah, I mean, you've been in business for a really long time. Do you mentor her? Like, what's your approach with, with Alex? Yes, Um She was young. She had worked in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Um, I just, you just have to let somebody know to, to, I just kept emphasizing, be yourself. I know the tendency is to feel like you need to be somebody different on TV, but my God, if you could be yourself, you're so damn charming and adorable and smart and funny, just if you can relax and have confidence, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to blow up here. It's going to be fine. You're not going to get fired. And that just took time to believe. Um, yeah. It, you know, it's it funny time. you say we're not going to get fired. I wonder if you have the same, the same approach today, like the way, the way the climate is now, uh, like you're probably a little more oh, fearless when you said that. I was more fearless because, since then, well, that was 2014, I've almost been fired three or four times. I've been suspended a couple times. Yeah, we're going to get at, into that in a second, <laughs> if you don't mind. But, but, but let me, let me uh, the, pre, uh, the prelude to that conversation is, you are a naturally glib person. And uh, you're, I can look at you and say, well, your brain's whirring a thousand miles an hour. Yes. Um, how, how do you then, how difficult is that to control uh, and and do you do you do you have a filter at all? Do you are conscious of a filter, at, and if you do, because sometimes that can defeat your glibness. So so how do you handle all that with your brain whirring the way it does? There is a devil and an angel on my opposite shoulders, no question about it. What I have a tendency to do is. Go trust myself not to get fired. I know, I believe that I can go right up to the line, jump over it and be able to jump back without being offensive. 
You got to. I have to trust myself. I get, I, I get that. I hear, and here's where it helps probably with that. You are in your number one rating. Well, that helps. Right? So you have, you're wearing a suit of armor anyway. That's true. <laughs> that is true. Uh, because no matter what management, you know, like I said before, oh my God, did he just say that? Well, that's what the audience seems to want. Um, so there it is, this suit of armor. But I don't think I say... Well, I, yeah, I do say stuff that you would never hear out of anybody else's <laughs> mouth on morning television. That's true. <laughs> all right. Let, let's talk about some mistakes. Uh, We've all had them. I've had a ton of what? them, as you well know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, you, you know, firstly, you you left the show. Uh, how much do you want to talk about the time that you left the show because of depression? Well, that's fine, because... I'm happy to talk about it now because it changed my life. Um, a bunch of stuff happened. My mom died. I was very close to my mother. Oh my God. Uh, she, I, that's where I get my sense of humor. She passed and then the, the mother of my children passed. And so all these, these constants of my life are now poof gone. So I've got two daughters, their mom's gone. My mom's gone. I just didn't process it very well. In fact, I didn't, I didn't process it at all. So it just kept building up and I started drinking and doing other stuff that you shouldn't be doing. And I got into a relationship that ended. I was sad about that. She wanted kids. I didn't want to. We had to break up. So all this comes to a head. And I got wet. I went into a deep, deep depression. I don't know if you've ever been there. Oh, yes. I, I couldn't, have. I couldn't move. Yes. So I had I had to call into the station and say, I'm sick. Uh, at first I faked it and said I had the flu, but I couldn't, I couldn't go and sleep in my own bed. I had to sleep on the couch. Then I just wander around Philly. I thought I will never get over this depression. It got so bad. I called a psychiatrist, hired him. It was up in Balakinwood and he put me on an antidepressant. And he said, now one thing, Mike, do not drink alcohol. I promised him I wouldn't. I left and went to a bar. So then I'm mixing booze and antidepressants. And you know, that's a, a, a real no, no. So, uh, my behavior became pretty erratic. I was late to work. The final straw was I had to make a public appearance in about a thousand in front of a thousand people. And they thought I was tipsy. I'd had two drinks. It was Valentine's day evening, 2017. And the next day, my general manager said, you got to go. Uh, and I said, oh, I can do this on my own. No, you can't. Bah, 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 bah. But thank God the company has a plan where they'll let you go to uh, rehab or whatever you want to call it, uh, mental health resort. Uh, so I went to a place in North Carolina that they found for me. And 30 straight days of intense therapy, um, no alcohol, obviously. And through that therapy, every day and every evening, I came out of there and never had the negative thoughts that I was having most of my life, but especially over the, the 10 years prior to that. Constantly filled with anxiety, negative thoughts, um, and, and deep depression. And when I came out of there and came back to Philly and then continued treatment for another two or three months, therapy, uh, I've never had those thoughts ever again. Well, uh, you know, that's a, a, a story that of redemption and, and everybody appreciates the fact that you, you, you faced up to it and, and that your company allowed you to do it. Um, let's, let's talk about a couple other, <laughs> I don't know if they're missteps, but the things that you've, uh, were in the news for, for uh, first of all, you got ripped by John Oliver, who, uh, who said that you're, you had gross treatment of your female colleagues. Now your, your body and, and you're kind of a, like a man's man type of guy. Uh, I would, I would dare say maybe a Lothario a little bit. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, it, 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 like when John Oliver puts you on HBO, uh, what's that like? That was fucked. <laughs> I, that, that, I, I, that, that is the worst thing that ever happened to me in my career. And I'm still mad about it. 
because I was raised with a strong mother, four sisters that I lived with. I married a woman. I have two daughters and I work with 95% of the people I've worked with in my career are women. A lot of producers and directors are women. So when they did that, want me to take you back when that happened? Yeah, it was International Women's Day. It was a Wednesday. I bought flowers for Karen and Alex to give the, to them on International Women's Day. And, you know, we joked about it, you know, uh, you know, self-deprecating. Uh, here are your flowers and stuff like that. And so he, his producers took an, probably it was the nine o'clock hour they edited. They edited all this stuff out of context to make me look bad and look like I was a prick, some kind of misogynist, nasty women, woman hater and totally out of context. And I, my staff saw the Wednesday show. No one said anything. Our audience watched that Wednesday show. Nobody said anything. The only time it became an issue is when they re-edited it out of context and presented it as I'm a horrible human being. It aired on a Sunday night. Now everybody's upset. You weren't upset when we did it live. Yeah. You saw it all. You heard it all. Oh, uh, everybody was out of the office. Nobody was watching. That is all bullshit. Uh, so you can tell I'm still pissed off about it to this day. So I, yes, I, you are. You are. So, so I had this station respond to that. Uh, for some reason, they believe fucking John Oliver. I said, it was at, it was at, at a, you all watch the show live. You can tell it's been edited to make me look bad. So it got taken up to New York. We're going to fire you. I, I came this close to being fired over this goddamn thing. Uh, it's, thank God some people were on my side up at in the, with the attorney's office up in New York. And they had people come down and talk to me about, you know, uh, this is bad. Uh, you were this close to being fired. It's better not happen again. Well, motherfucker, it never happened in the first place. <laughs> you know, so, but they did not. They, they didn't defend me. They wouldn't let me make a you statement. Tried, but but, but has, it, has it changed you in any way that you now have to be ultra careful or more well, careful? Well, I'm more careful. But again, what did, what did we do wrong? So I'm yeah, more careful, right. yes. I, get it. I, I went back and looked at some tape from the 90s. Oh, my God, the stuff we've said. You know. Yeah, it, 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 the landscape has completely changed. Uh, here's my favorite. Uh, you uh, you call out Kellyanne Conway. Oh God, who I loathe. Uh, and if you listen to my show, you you can probably figure out where where I am when mm -hmm. it comes to that whole that right wing dynamic. And you said that she's good at bullshit, and you said that on the yeah camera. that came. Well, it was I don't know if you remember the day, but she was out in front of the White House, and obviously people were lying about what happened in this particular event. And she, uh, she used a term I'd never heard before. She says, well, it's, it's just all alternative facts. And out of that tape, they pop up me. And I go, you mean it's bullshit? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and I... <laughs> Listen, it's classic. Did, uh, I, I don't know. Did they, were they able to censor that or not? No, I, it went I out. If I made a mistake like that, I got 10 seconds to correct the... Point. No, no, it went out over the air. It went on. They, I finished okay, the, the show... Air. I finished the show. I was called to the general manager's office, and he goes, well, I can't say exactly what he said. They weren't, they weren't highly upset, but they said, we, we got to suspend you for two days. So I got on a plane and went to Florida. Yeah, I've been suspended a few times, and I did the same thing. Okay, good night. I'll talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> That's the way, That's the way I ha I've handled it. Uh, so, uh, But I shouldn't have said it. You can't say that on the air. No, no, I get it, but but it leads to this because I think that you slant liberally, because um, yeah. you're 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 a righteous, thoughtful, logical person that I, I've I've uh, socialized with, so I know I know yeah. what you're all about. I'll tell that story in a second at the Super Bowl at the ESPN party, <laughs> but but, uh, but but you work you also work for Fox, so I, I wonder if that's there's any it's, conflict. In it's that. perfect. People, 
Some people think we're, we, that we're Fox News Channel, which we're not. We're they're separate entities. We belong to a Fox Station group, and we're under the umbrella of a giant corporation, 21st Century Fox. So Fox News Channel's up in New York. They do their thing, but they don't affect us. We don't. We use one of their reporters. Uh, his name is uh, Doug, uh, and he really does is not opinionated. So it's kind of an interesting dichotomy. People will sometimes yell at me, "Ah, oh, you're a Fox," but ninety five percent of our you audience. Also, do some weekend filling. You or at least used to. Oh, Fox I used to do that. Uh, I used to do that uh, to get extra money, and I really enjoyed my time in New York to see my friends, and I really liked the people that that I worked with up there at the network. But it got so slanted and one sided, I couldn't do it anymore. I felt sick after the show, so yeah. I just told them. I can't do this anymore. And plus, I was working 21 straight days. All right. So here's the, the story, Darren. I don't even know. Darren, my producers listen to this. So Mike and I are up at the, uh, the, the whole Fox team. Your whole Good Morning, uh, uh, Good Day Philadelphia team is up at the Super Bowl and uh, doing stuff up there. And, and I'm doing the show up there. And This uh, is the Super Bowl that was at MetLife? In North- yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. So there are Eagles a couple, obviously a lot yeah. of a lot of monster parties, a Maxim party and an ESPN party. ESPN party <laughs> was the biggest one at the time, and so Mike is there uh, with all his Fox buddies at this uh, event where I forget what the event was, but uh, you know, here I'm. I'm kind of an interloper. You know, like I've appeared on on the show, but I'm kind of an interloper. I'm not in the inner sanctum. So the the whole Fox crew. Uh, go, we're going to the ESPN party. And uh, like they, they kind of ice me out of the whole thing. They grab in, they, they file into their cabs, boom, boom, and they're going to go. And I'm working for you. We're ESPN affiliated at the time. So I got a little bit of a connection there. Sure. So they go, they don't need Miss Nelly. I mean, he's the last guy to get into a cab. He's left out. So he, he goes, all right, I'll go with you. So we <laughs> we go, and I get the backdoor entry to the ESPN party. Come, come on in, Mike. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we, we go, oh, hey, Mike Bissonelli, I think sure you were. So we, we go to the back door, we get into the ESPN party, which is banging. We look over at the entrance, all his crew is being held up. They can't get into the party. <laughs> it but was, the one person <laughs> who snaked into the party was Casey McDonald, who was a trafficker. At the time, right? <laughs> yes. And, and, yeah. And so with her so hot she, girlfriends, she's in there and she's looking and they're looking, hey, Casey, hey, Casey. And she turns their, <laughs> her back on them and goes into the party. And they were left in the front front step. And we're, we're, we're into the party. Carmen's yeah, a fantastic. bitch. <laughs> That's right. They all <laughs> we, had to we, go we, back we, to their hotel. We go to the Maxim party. I, I saw this woman that we, I thought was beautiful, but I didn't want to, like, yeah, I'm shy like why. But Mike's not shy. So I go, can you do me a favor? Go over to that woman. I want to take a picture of this woman. Just go over and pose with her. And I go, hey, this is a big TV star from Philly. He would he would like to be in a picture with you. <laughs> take a picture. Come but on. Any event, you, you have always been <laughs> you have always been a supporter of the sh- of, of my radio show. You've been an yes. avid listener. You will text me in the middle of a show sometimes. Uh, I know. Uh, when it's I had probably show. annoying. Why were you such an avid listener to my show? Because of what we said at the top of this podcast. You're you're just a real guy. You're so honest, highly intelligent, and I it it actually would help me prepare for my TV show because I always wanted to hear your perspective because I don't follow sports as deeply as you do. So I have to admit, sometimes I would just use you to gain knowledge about what I needed to talk about the next day. So I would it would be Mike Messinelli's take coming out of my my mouth a lot of times no no you're just so friggin honest um it's just entertaining the whole damn show is entertaining well it used to be um, <laughs> well those little games you played and all that you know yeah it was great the show was great and here I sit <laughs> so, in your underwear. Yeah, in my underwear. <laughs> but in any event, like if you were to interview me, like I'm, I'm doing, I'm interviewing you here for my if you, if the Mike Jarrett podcast, and you got me as a guest. Where, what, how would you question me? Well, it's been a long journey, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't know exactly how you ended up on radio because weren't you a, a, a print person by total accident? Now, I, I will tell you that I was a fan of talk radio when I was a kid. 
And I don't know if you remember this name. I was a kid in WCAU radio station in Philly. Used to do talk radio. In fact, that's where I first heard Steve Fredericks, who would become my partner. Oh, yeah. But I used to listen to this guy named Saul Weinstein. He, he, he was like a pioneer in talk radio. He was bawdy. He was fearless. He was honest. And I, and I was an impressionable kid. And I go, oh, this is unbelievable. It was captivating to me. So while I was a fan of talk radio, and then Steve Fredericks was the only guy doing really sports talk radio at the time. And I couldn't stand him. He was so arrogant. I used to listen to him to get mad. Years later, he becomes my partner. Like, it, the coincidence is amazing. But, yes, I was a print guy, and I – um I worked as a newspaper reporter where you don't have any personality. You're in a background completely. Right. And, and so I lived this whole different life of being a print journalism, a jerk journalist. And then once on the Inquirer sports staff, talk radio starts in Philly in 1990. And we got together our own show because we have sports on radio. Oh, that's fun. Let's get our own show together. We call it the morning sports page. It was a bunch of Inquirer guys from the Inquirer sports department. The more they heard us, the more they liked us. They needed content. They needed hosts. The first guy they poached was Angelo Cataldi. Mm. He was one of the premier writers that we had on the Encore Sports staff. And we all looked around going, oh, my God. If he would go and take a chance like that, why wouldn't we? Yeah. So out of the blue, from me doing part-time stuff, they offer me the evening drive show with Steve Fredericks, a radio veteran. And that's how I started radio. Totally by accident. I had no desire to do it. It was just they poached us from the Inquirer Sports staff. I took a chance. I signed a one-year contract. Was the money better? I had no idea. What's that? Was the money better than print? The money was 30000 better. Okay. For what I was making. I was making $50,000 at the, at the Inquirer. They, they signed me a one-year deal for 85000 at WIP radio station. And at that time, I go, you know, I've got a law degree. I can, if this doesn't work, I can, I can always do it. I like being, being an inquiry journalist. I just didn't like, I wanted to make a little more money. So I, I took a leap and it turned into this career. Were you like you are on radio? I mean, have you been this way your whole life? I guess. Uh, but you know, like, like being a, a, a print journalist, you're compl- have a completely different perspective yeah. and personality. So you're, you're not a fan. You're not a Yahoo. And, and so when you cross over, you got to find that fine line. And that's what I tried to do. Be honest, but say, don't be a Yahoo because this wasn't in my nature to be that. But, you know, occasionally push the envelope. I learned to be a sports talk host from doing How it long that take till you were comfortable? Um. It, it, I listen. When I was weak, I showed my personality on the weekends. I did a show with Stan Hoffman, and and that it was completely. It was like till I was living two lives. One is a serious journalist, the other as a sports talk guy who was outrageous. And and Steve saw that he let me be outrageous. He was the radio vet. He was in the business for years and years. Great success in Boston and Philadelphia. And he said to me, he "Goes, you've got to be the front man for this show because you, you've got this." this communication gift and blah, 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 blah. So he allowed me to be an asshole basically yeah. while I, I was, and, and while I was not trying to be an asshole, I had genuine opinions. I wasn't trying to do hot takes, but I, I could get myself do to you a th- point. Do where- you think you've perfected being an asshole? <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people, I think that I have been the most misunderstood guy. Well, then tell me about that. That's what I really Let me add that you used to be, you were a lot more abrasive when you, Mike, I don't know if you know this. I was Mike's producer for the better part of a decade at IP back in early 2000, late 90s, early 2000. You were a lot more abrasive when, uh, when you were kind of getting your wheels spinning, Mike. You kind of even that out a bit. Well, Mike, here's been my, my whole mantra is that, like I grew up as as a fan, like everybody else here does. I always had a sense of the fan getting fucked, and when I saw that, I I thought it was my responsibility to advocate for the fan who hence was my listener. I wasn't doing it on purpose. I was doing it because I thought it was right. I thought it was the right thing to do. Now that got me in trouble with a lot of organizations, obviously, but I was never on the organization side. I was on protect the this little person. You know, the little person is the one. Who's who's lives and breathes this and deserves better than what he's getting, and that, that's always mm-hmm. been my my whole thing as far as doing sports talk radio. So, say on this theme, what is because I know you outside of radio. What is the the biggest thing, the, the biggest misunderstanding about you? The 
perception of well, you. Well, they, they think I'm an, I, I think that people, when they hear me being abrasive on the air, they think I'm an asshole. But I'm I'm off the air, a different, completely different person. It's like you are. Uh, like I'm, I want in the booth in that f- little booth. You feel protected that you can say mm-hmm. anything that you want. Outside of that, it's bigger. It's a it's a bigger world, and so you can't like be that type of guy. And like I think I'm fairly normal. But when I'm doing a show, it's like anything else. Yeah. You have to be on. You know, you, you have to be on. But you, you have not to be on because for four hours. people may be confused listening to this whole thing because when I said. I'm being myself, but it's just double the energy. Yeah, I, I think uh, that I am, but I'm more. Qui- I'm certainly more quiet off the air than uh, I, I am because I feel like I'm protected <laughs> being being in a booth, and, no, and I, I can say I, and, and, uh, I have this sense of righteousness, and I have this logical side of me. If things don't make sense, it really irritates me, and I, that's how I projected it on the radio. Now, there's a one way I've changed over the years. I used to be um, no patience. And some guy came to me one day and says, you know, not everybody is as into this as you are. And not everybody uh, has as much talent as the next person in, in the newsroom or whatever. So you got to calm down. It's your tone. You have a nasty tone with people. So <laughs> I've tried to be better about that. Yeah, no, I, I've had, I've had that, but I always figured out a way to bounce back from that. Like I, self deprecation is the way you do that. You go overboard. You make fun of yourself. You laugh at yourself. When I rant something, sometimes I'll laugh at my, myself on how how intense the rant was. So, so there, there there are ways that you have to do it mm-hmm. that I don't think young people who do sports talk radio understand that yeah. that it's a craft that you have to cultivate. Um, you have to go up and down. And you have to make fun of yourself and you have to talk about yourself, maybe in unflattering things. That that makes Uh, the fullest show possible. What is the biggest regret? But that was a very good tack to take an interview with me. It was very probing. I've had a ton of of regrets. I mean, I got fired uh, for, uh, uh, and I regret that 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 happened when I got into an altercation with a producer. And I look back at it and I go, you know, I'm, I'm a guy from a small town who had to fight a lot to get ahead and uh so my sensibilities when they get offended uh triggered that incident that that, that guy was way out of line with me that day <laughs> and i reacted like i would react uh you know if i had mm-hmm. a a high school fight <laughs> and, and so, that, so that that i regret that I and mean, here's what i part i regret most because i have a daughter that Obviously, she lives here. She's getting married this month, by the way. She's grown up like in front of my eyes. And I always I felt terrible that I was this uh, yeah. pariah and uh, I was this public story. And I, I I got fired because I lost control. And it wasn't about me as much as it was. Oh, my God. How's that to look at my daughter? You know, like it's, I'm, I, I embarrassed her, like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because I'm time. a headline. So that that was my my biggest regret uh, with that. I th- and I regret reacting over the top, but I don't re- regret standing up for myself oh. in that particular situation, which was what I did. Uh, I am, I am, um, I'm available, Mike. <laughs> I'm, ava- I'm sp- Listen, I'm doing this podcast. It's great. I love the people at Bet Rivers. This is fantastic. I do it from my home. I, uh, it still lets me be me yeah. without the caller input. And I think that that's what I miss most of all dealing with people on an everyday basis. Uh, but I look at what's happened to this industry and I just, I shake my head. Yeah, and I, I, I just can't believe that uh, it has been allowed to, to go down. And maybe that's just the general change. You know, Angela is no longer there. I'm no longer there. There's, a, I understand things change, but I certainly had a lot more to give, and I, I wasn't prepared for what they did, and I still do not understand it because it doesn't make one bit of sense, radio success wise. <laughs> so that's mm-hmm. that's the end of that. It was. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I just don't get it. And I see, I think sometimes when ego management egos get involved and they, and they think they know, but they don't. Uh, and, and that's the tragedy of it because the supposed radio professionals made a decision like this. And I shake my head and go, how could you be a radio professional? I not, not understand what turns out. He's a pretty good guest. Got a fixed 95 pretty quickly. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so, Mike, this has been a, this has been a real. No, pleasure, we're, we're going to get into your dating life now. Are no, you we're not. Oh, we're out of time. No, I, I, I'm getting into my dating life. <laughs>
Okay. Not at all. Because <laughs> I, I can go tenfold into your dating life. Uh, okay. And, 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 we're, we're not, and, and that would take another hour. Okay, look at uh, that. Right, so, the sun is setting. Uh, I got to go. Uh, all right, listen, uh, have fun and uh, talk. To be, feel free to, to talk about the Mike Missinelli podcast on, uh, on Good Day, Philadelphia. I will mention it tomorrow. You mentioned it tomorrow how it was such a probing interview. And the people that really want to get to know Mike Jarek should mm-hmm. tune into the Mike Missinelli podcast. In fact, it was so probing. I mean, I need to get some Vaseline, so I'll be right back. <laughs> See, that's the kind of thing you, you, you would get in trouble for on uh, your that's show, right. but not on my show. <laughs> All right. Good to see you, Mike. All right, Mike. Thank Good you again. You. Have fun. I pre- we'll, we'll hook up down the road. Bye, Darren. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it, buddy. You got it. It's the Mike Missanelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. All right. Thanks so much to Mike Jarek. I had so much fun uh, talking to him, uh, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, he's, you know, we've hung out a few times. I was getting to know him uh, personally, and you know, we kind of have similar stories, uh, ups and downs in, in this business. Uh, but uh, I, I will say this: anybody that does that that morning show uh, at that level for that many years uh, amazes me. I have great respect, as you know. I had the great respect for Angela for doing it many years. I had the same respect for Mike because. Uh, you know, listen, he's not a guy that will go to bed at seven o'clock, right? He he enjoys life. And then he's got to be on like every morning with, with the same kind of energy. And I, that is really difficult. Yeah, very difficult to do. So thank uh, thanks, Mike, for coming on. And, uh, gee, I, you know, I don't know how many more years he's going to do it. But uh, as long as he's vibrant, he seems vibrant. Uh, we'll have him around a lot longer on uh, Good Day Philadelphia. Uh, so time to close it down now. Thanks to Bet Rivers. Uh, for uh, sponsoring this podcast. And uh, don't forget about uh, my Friday video blog. I do, uh, so this, you know, you haven't had enough of me yet. Uh, Friday, I do a video blog on my website called, uh, on, uh, the website is mikemiss.com. And I fire up about a good five to 10 minutes on some topics that uh, uh, are pertinent. So don't forget to check that out, my Friday video blog, where I will also talk about my sound off competition when you send me an email that is a version of what i used to do in the past on the radio show called sound off where you call the voice line and left a message uh the only problem here is not that's not a problem but the only effort you have to make is you have to write it out so just write it out send me an email the email address is mike at mike miss.com and i'm giving away a uh, mike missinelli podcast hat uh, and some swag that we've been able to get here uh and and it'll be unique you'll be the only one walking around your neighborhood with a mike missinelli podcast a hat, which is a really good item. And all you got to do is uh, send me something that will impress me. Uh, it doesn't have to be about sports. It can be about sports. It can be about life. It can be a poignant uh, uh, examination of uh, world culture, whatever it is. If you get my attention with it, we'll give you the hat. But you got to look at my video blog because I will read our last uh, week's winner uh, and give you an idea of what uh, why uh, that was our first winner. You can also follow me on Twitter at MikeMiss25. Uh, and don't forget to get to Natalie Vineyards, the winery that I uh, partly own down there at Cape May Courthouse, New Jersey. It's wine drinking season. Uh, if you're down the shore, uh, make it a, a side venture for you, uh, Natalie Vineyards. And you can order our wines, which are very, very good. I'm a, I'm a wine guy, so I'm not steering you down the, uh, a wrong uh, road here. The, the wines are solid, and you can order them online. Just go to our website. NatalieVineyards.com. That's N A T A L I Vineyards, V I N E Y A R D S.com. Uh, all right. Uh, happy Fourth of July. Hope everybody had a good Fourth of July. Uh, Darren and I were smoking a cigar, watching fireworks, which I will address on our next podcast next week. The whole concept of fireworks. I don't quite get it. Darren loves it. Right, Darren? I, I love it because. I, I'm right there on the beach watching uh-huh. fireworks. I don't need to watch fireworks anywhere else, but when they're right there and they're exploding over the water, it's majestic. All right, well, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, like, yeah. We'll talk about that our next podcast uh, a, a week after. Uh, all right, so everybody have a great rest of the day. Have a great weekend. Uh, stay indoors because uh, the heat index is pretty troubling out there. Have a great uh, weekend, everybody. Uh, this is the Mike Masnelli Podcast. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you later. Thanks for listening to the Mike Bessinelli podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.